to lose uh, you know the trust of, of your customers. Um, so this kind of sets the stage for a supply chain. You know, I trust you. You wrote some software on your laptop, and both you and I might trust that software just fine. Uh, but you wrote it on a laptop. Neither of us built the laptop. Neither of us designed the laptop. We don't know how it got to the store. We don't know the people working in the store. We don't know which factory built it or who who was working in the factory. And and as you can see, this is a, a supply chain that goes quite deep. Um, and not everyone in that supply chain has your best interests in mind. Some of them have different motivations. You know, your factory might be motivated to just produce as many widgets as possible. There might be a, a, a worker in the factory who might be getting some money on the side uh, to grant access to somebody else. We, we really don't know. Um, and we've seen all of these things happen, of course. Um, it is clear that this is an unsolvable problem. Um, it's turtles all the way down, as they say. Uh, and how far down the supply chain you want to extend your trust model is really up to you. And of course, that comes with cost. Uh, and this needs naturally to topics like risk management. Um, so, if, I mean, if you're making military jets, for example, you're going to extend your trust model quite deep into the supply chain. If you're making, you know, $20 consumer electronics, smart light bulbs or whatever, um, you, you may not care so much. And, you know, like I said, the, the cost increases the deeper you go. Um, a, a general rule of thumb is you want to have at least two parties working in collusion to defeat your security measures. If, if you have all your trust in one basket, all your eggs in one basket, um, you know, then, then your security measures are more easily bypassed. <clears throat> so here's a, a good example from the news last year, kind of highlights the problems you can get with supply chains. Um, obviously, not everyone in this particular supply chain had the same interests in mind. It's kind of a humorous example, but something that could happen. <clears throat> so as a concept, uh, it's a bit of a loaded term. Everyone you talk to about supply chain is going to hear something different when you say the word supply chain. Uh, and so when I when I hear the words, I'm, I'm specifically talking about product security. That's that's my background. Um, but there's other related fields here. So like global logistics is how to move things from one place to another. Your factories, they're going to have uh, IT security networks in there, and you're going to want to lock down all your endpoints and have firewalls and all that sort of stuff. And that's very important, of course. Um, but that's not generally what I'm talking about here. Uh, as well as uh, software supply chain, I get I get asked about it uh, frequently. So I put in a couple of slides here, but it's not really the, the focus. Um, so here, this is an example where somebody had, uh, this is a research paper actually, uh, um, some university researchers, they realized that when you're installing software on like a Linux system, there's these nice package managers. And if you, you know, make a typo and try and install the wrong package, uh, you usually get an error, unless there's a package with that name that exists. Uh, and so what they did is they put in a bunch of fake packages with typo names, uh, and they, they were able to get root on like thousands and thousands of machines. It was an academic paper and they published the results. They got a lot of this stuff fixed, but I mean, if someone wanted to do this in anger, uh, it could easily be done. Um, here's another example. So Target, I remember, if you remember this a couple of years ago, my credit card was affected, probably many others here. Um, basically Target has a fairly large organization. They've got a mature security posture, uh, but they had been dealing with, um, this is, sorry, some noise out the window. Um, but yeah, they had a, an HVAC vendor who obviously didn't have as much uh, security expertise as Target does. And so the HVAC vendor was breached. And then from there, they were able to get into Target's network uh, and steal my credit card number. Uh, CCleanup is a tool that's used for uh, cleaning up Windows machines or something. I'm not exactly sure what the deal is there. But this company was was breached. Their, their stage one uh, payload here had a very specific name of like a dozen companies in it. Uh, and so this was more of a first stage attack. They were attacking this company and they were hoping that some of those other targets were using that particular piece of software so they could compromise them. And then the ultimate target was probably someone that those companies were using. Um, and so there was some security analysis here and I was kind of hoping by now there'd be more public information about that, the next stage payload. But this is sort of getting into the very complicated um, actors and they may not actually end up being public. Uh, and, Last example here. So Kaspersky makes a antivirus tool, um, and it turned out that their their network was compromised, and, so, and it, people were using their uh, system as a sort of a search engine looking for specific NSA tools. Um, and so, you know, just just because you know you trust your software doesn't necessarily mean someone behind the scenes isn't misusing it. So when we get to the hardware, what we're we talking about here. So generally, when we're talking about things at the top of this pyramid here, these are the most secure devices, smart cards and, and things derived from them, like TPMs and secure elements. These are very secure and robust pieces of silicon. Um, you know, they grew up in the 90s during the satellite TV hacking era. Um, and as a result, they became very secure. Back then, there was a lot of competition between the satellite TV companies. They were hacking each other's uh, smart cards and, re and releasing the, the details online to try and you know, get more support uh, in the ecosystem for their own products. 
Um, and as a result, like like I said, it was kind of a cat and mouse game and they got very, very secure. Um, the reason I've crossed off TPM is we see them integrated into a lot of devices. Uh, and the way that even though the, the silicon itself, the chip is a very secure piece of silicon, it's often integrated in a very poor way. So one of our, our researchers released something a couple of years ago, a tool called TPM Genie, uh, which at the circuit level, which is very cheap to attack, bypasses a lot of the measures here. Um, yeah, and then as you go down the pyramid, you get to you know more and more mass market devices where you know security becomes less and less. Um, I'm not going to say important, but the attention to the detail becomes less and less. And generally, what we're seeing is that everything is about 15 years behind uh, the state of the art for security. When you, when you get down to the bottom, and this is where we're, a lot of IoT devices are are at. Uh, we, we've seen some of our our customers uh, doing their best to try and get to the top of the pyramid, and some of them doing quite well at it. Uh, but the vast majority of devices are, are very much at the bottom to the point that we now have legislation in a lot of jurisdictions that are trying to cut off that long tail of insecure devices. They're setting a minimum bar of, you know, if your device is below this threshold, it's actually going to be illegal to sell it. Um, and that's kind of how bad it is. But basically what you want to be able to do is kind of push the attacker up the pyramid where it's going to cost them more. The hardware attacker will always win. If there are secrets in the device, they can be extracted. It just It might take more equipment, more money, more time. Uh, but if you can raise that bar, then you've eliminated a large number of attackers. And that's that's kind of the goal here. So the typical factory process, I mean, if you're building devices or working with an OEM who's building devices, you're going to see something like this. You, you're buying components from a bunch of different vendors. You're going to put them on the board. You're going to do some testing, some assembly, more testing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is kind of your normal healthy supply chain. Uh, parts come in, devices are built and tested, et cetera. Uh, there's a difference, of course, between in-house and contract manufacturing and ODM uh, manufacturing models, uh, and, and not all steps necessarily happen in the same place. Uh, a good example of this is customization and fulfillment centers. So like at the Indianapolis airport, for example, there's large customs bonded warehouses that are specifically de um, dedicated to software and hardware configuration of devices. So airplanes come in with devices from overseas where they were manufactured, all the firmware gets reloaded, the devices get configured, and then from there, they get distributed uh, for resale. Uh, so, I mean, if you're setting up your, your model, you, you can get, I guess my point is that this process can get quite complicated logistically. Um, another good example here is that, that made in USA sticker that you see on things. Uh, technically what that means is substantially modified in the USA. And practically what that means is a lot of folks will build their devices in Mexico, ship them across the border to Dallas, and then they'll reload the firmware. Uh, and that can um, legally fits the definition of substantially modified. Uh, so in, the, in a case like that, you know, if you have a security issue, who owns the, the, that problem? You, know, you have a physical security issue in your supplier, but the cost is going to be borne by the OEM or by the reseller or someone else down the chain. Um, so unless your contracts are set up in such a way, it's really hard to assign blame um, and who's going to pay for it. So not shown here is prototype manufacturing. It's going to be very similar. Uh, a lot higher privilege is often necessary uh, to configure devices and what not for prototypes. You know, security features might not be turned on yet. Devices not, not, might not be locked down. Um, and the contracts actually, since I mentioned it, can get quite complicated. Um, contracts aren't, are set up from a business perspective. They're often not set up with security in mind. By the time the security people are brought in, usually the contract is already signed and it becomes very difficult uh, to put things in like, um, like penalties for security breaches and things of that nature. So on top of that, we have kind of this data flow. Um, so things that come down from, from the OEM, you're going to be passing down firmware images, you're going to be passing down serial numbers, certificates, all these assets that get programmed into the devices. And flowing upwards, you're going to have things like logs, uh, you know, yield numbers, and things like that. This is kind of your normal healthy data flow. Um, so some of, the, some of the data that flows up could be aggregated. Uh, often, you, you'll have a supplier who doesn't want to give you all the detailed information. From that, you can get yield numbers, and then you can use that as a as a, a data point to, to negotiate prices and things like that. Uh, and so they tend to keep that as a closely guarded secret. Um, but the provisioning data that flows downhill is usually very interesting. So if you're provisioning certificates on your devices, uh, then that could be used for counterfeiting, for example. Uh, so making sure that that's protected uh, throughout this whole process becomes a problem. <clears throat> so the, and when we're talking about IoT devices specifically, there's almost always this customer activation step. There's some, something that happens to the device in the field where the customer is going to turn it on, it's going to connect to some back end system, and that, that kind of closes that loop. Uh, and, and that'll be important in a minute, and I'll explain. So, grafted onto this, we also have this thing called the shadow supply chain. And this is the thing that you don't like. Um, so, you know, parts are sourced uh, from, from 
all sorts of places. You know, you get used, stolen, scrapped, obsolete devices uh, and components. You, prototype runs uh, from various stages. Uh, all, all of those things you can't sell, they end up somewhere in, into this uh, shadow supply chain. Uh, you might have surplus devices from your sales channel. You, you got, you know, you know, thousands of devices sitting in a warehouse that don't get sold. Those will eventually get uh, sold into this shadow supply chain, torn down for for parts and then reused. Um, you might have illicitly imported devices, depending on you know where you're selling your devices, etc. Um, and and often these components are going to be of lower quality in some way, um, cheaper. And then that cheaper is basically the incentive for why this exists. Um, and so generally, this, this shadow supply chain has a parasitic relationship with your supply chain. Uh, you know, the parts and, uh, and data are flowing outwards from the legitimate supply chain into the shadow supply chain. Uh, and, but that's not always true. Um, sometimes you get alternative parts coming into your supply chain. Uh, your, your QA processes should be able to detect any kind of uh, shenanigans going on there, but it doesn't always get caught. So you have to be vigilant. Um, now, so, sometimes you end up with whole devices coming in. Um, an example of this years ago, we had uh, we we had a contract with a manufacturer over in I think it was Hungary, um, and and they had a sister factory in China. And and what happened was we had some people over there visiting, just doing some inspections or whatever. And and there was like a whole like truck full of devices, like eighty thousand units sitting there. And they said, well, where do those come from? And it turns out that they decided that if they if our, the factory we were working with outsourced to their sister factory in China, they could build these devices cheaper. And so they started doing that. These particular devices were you know, being sold to to like US and UK government at the time. Uh, so there's a lot of concerns. And so we had to go through all of those 80,000 devices and figure out, you know, are they legitimate? Um, and you see lots of examples like this. And and it turns out they were just doing it for cost reduction reasons. And when you outsource it to, a, to another company, they're going to be motivated by profit like anyone else. And so they're going to be looking to cut corners like this. Um, and security is not necessarily top of their list. So here's kind of a safety related example. I don't know if anybody had one of these Nokia phones. They were virtually indestructible. Um, but the third party batteries that people were buying, uh, they tended not to, to work very well. <laughs> they, they caught fire, um, people got burned, it became quite a big nightmare. All of these cases were traced back to third party batteries, counterfeits. Um, and so as a result, you know, I, I being working at a, a mobile handset vendor at the time, our lawyers got involved and they said, hey, we have to do something to show that we're not going to be vulnerable to this same problem. Um, and so if you see on the left corner of this battery, there's a little lock picture. So that, that's a secure battery, quote unquote. Um, and basically, we, you know, like everybody else in the in the market at the time, we were doing just enough to to stay ahead of the the bad guys, to so our lawyers would be happy that we were covering our butt. The, basically, what happened was the batteries themselves uh, inside there is a lithium ion battery. It cost about two dollars. The aftermarket batteries were sold anywhere from thirty to ninety dollars, and so there's a huge profit for anyone who can make their own. Uh, and one of the ways that they would cut costs is they would remove all of the protection circuitry, the things that prevent you from overcharging the battery and making it catch fire. Um, so this, uh, one, one of the solutions to this ended up being, we just dropped our price. The profit disappeared, people stopped doing it. Um, and that was kind of a nice solution, something to watch for. Um, imagine there's a lot of folks out closer to the mountains than I am, so you might recognize this. This is a, a camming device. This is not really a technology related device, but uh, this is a, a form of uh, rock climbing anchor. So when you're climbing, you, you shove this into the rock uh, and if you know you clip your rope to it when you fall, it, presumably saves your life. They retail anywhere between 80 and $150, depending on the size. Um, a number of years ago, uh, the company makes these started production in China. And within weeks, the market was flooded with $20 counterfeits. You can get them on eBay. Um, and you know the price sounded too good to be true. And it turns out it was. The counterfeits were so good in quality that, that the vendor's own salespeople couldn't tell them apart. Uh, and one of the expensive steps with aluminum uh, materials is, is the heat treating process. And that's where all the strength comes from. Uh, and so if you skip that, you save a huge cost, um, but also now these are not safe for use. I'm not aware of anyone being injured, but but for years, nobody would buy these devices. And so it, it definitely hurt their brand, um, another safety related incident. So this one here was on the news a couple of years ago. Um, there were some allegations uh, in a Bloomberg article about these super micro servers being backdoored uh, by the vendor in China, something to do with the Chinese government. It's been a couple of years now and there's been no further evidence. Everyone's denied it. I'm not sure there was any truth to it, but the fact is the technology is there. Uh, somebody actually put together a proof of concept showing that yes, you can in fact do that. It's exactly as described. Uh, it was a nice talk at a conference, uh, I guess last year, uh, Tremel Hudson did that. That was kind of neat. Um, but yeah, it, basically what this means is like if you're buying machines from somewhere, you need to put more due diligence into your security to make sure that things like this aren't slipping through. 
Uh, here's another example. Um, so Google was making these devices for two-factor authentication. They outsourced all of the production to Fishin, a company in China. Uh, and it turns out that in the manufacturing process, they were testing the Bluetooth. Looks like uh, a default key was left on these devices, effectively a backdoor that anybody could connect to them. Uh, and so as a result, they had to do a product recall and replace them all. Um, so I don't know if you saw this in the news, I guess it was maybe a year or two ago now, uh, but those have all been replaced with, uh, with a fix. But the, the issue here is that Google didn't have a lot of control over their manufacturing and design. They outsourced all of that. And so they just kind of got what they got and they didn't, they didn't do enough uh, due diligence on the process there. Uh, they probably saved some cost by outsourcing it, but you know, then they had to deal with all the aftermath. And so those are all examples really where there, you don't have this kind of uh, closed loop. There's, there isn't that customer activation step where the de device will connect back to your system. And so it's really hard to actually solve any of those particular examples. Uh, for most IoT devices, you're going to have that closed loop. Um, so basically when these devices connect back, like if it's a phone or, or a router or, or like any kind of uh, device that's gonna connect to your, your backend APIs, uh, you, you can see that information. <clears throat> so, I mean, wh why are people doing this? Why, why does this shadow supply chain exist? And, and the answer almost always is money. I mean, the, the movies like to think, uh, you know, it's, it's likely there's going to be some targeted attack and some government agents. And the reality, it, it, it's frankly always money. There's somebody who says, uh, you know, there's money to me. And the battery example is classic. Uh, you know, there, there was like $88 profit that they could make just by making counterfeit batteries. So. Um, <clears throat> for phones, there's subsidy locks and other kind of DRM things uh, are happening. Uh, jailbreaking on phones are, are interesting. Jail jailbreaking specifically is neat because all of that happens generally in the public. People are looking for ways to to get more privileged access to their devices. Uh, and you know, customer service, please. Center customer service. Western Union. Somebody could maybe put their mute on. That would be nice. Yeah. Can we mute, please? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the, all of the jailbreak vulnerabilities are being uh, discovered and exploits are being created, and then those get released to the public so anybody can use them. Um, and, and certainly if, you know, if, if the bad actors are out there, they have access to all of that. Uh, counterfeiting is definitely something that's where a lot of profit is being driven. Uh, component resale is huge. Devices, like, like I said, if you've got old devices that are maybe a year or two out of date, you can't really sell them as easily. So you might uh, sell them in bulk to, to somebody else and they might tear them down for parts and then reuse those, uh, take the parts off the board and then mark them up as, uh, as brand new and then try and resell them either back into your legitimate supply chain or somebody else's. Uh, happens more often than people think. Um, out of warranty repair is a neat one. Uh, in, in the mobile handset space, we saw uh, like DVDs full of information that was all leaked from our own factories uh, on how to repair devices. And it was all strictly for aftermarket. So we had old obsolete devices that we didn't repair in our own repair centers anymore. Um, but there's all this information floating around out there for these little mom and pop shops to, to repair those phones. Um, and so, but they relied almost exclusively on, on leaked information from our own processes. Um, laundering stolen devices. If you're tracking these devices, and, and we used to do this, we track all of our, our phones. The minute they leave the factory, we, you know, they have serial numbers. We have to activate them with the network carriers, et cetera. Um, and if they ever got stolen, they would go onto a, a blacklist uh, and they wouldn't work anymore. Um, and there's lots of different uh, international bodies that help maintain these block lists. Um, but if, if you do end up with uh, those devices on that, putting them back into your process, uh, into your through your repair center in small volumes, uh, they could actually launder those. But generally, when you take back a consumer electronic device, you take it back to the store and you say, hey, this doesn't work. Uh, they're going to give you your money back, give you a replacement, whatever. And at that point, that device is now laundered. Now it's in the system. And by the time you detect that there's an actual problem that, hey, the reason it doesn't work is because it was stolen, it's too late. Someone's already taken the cost of that. Uh, and so you might be on the hook for that. So how, how do the attacks work? I mean, how, how are the people at the, at the hardware and embedded systems uh, level, how are they attacking these devices? Uh, these are attacks that we've all seen in the wild. Um, these are things that, that you know, my team does every day when we're doing like security assessment. But back in like since at least 2002, 2003, we started seeing these kinds of attacks in volume. Um, so chip off is the first and easiest one. Um, if you take a device and you pull off the flash memory, you can reprogram it and put it back on. Uh, and because you're reusing that flash memory, there's no actual cost. It's only the labor cost of doing it. And if you're doing this in bulk, and if you're doing it in a, a geography where labor is cheap, then that becomes very, very cost effective. Uh, smartphones, for example, used to be a big problem with them being stolen. Uh, and people used to think, well, someone's stealing the phone to use it. And the reality is that they would get aggregated in, by the container load. 
being sent overseas, and then they would go through this kind of process. Um, very cost effective. Uh, mod chips. Uh, so these are little devices that you can slap onto your uh, onto your device, and it'll kind of modify the traffic as it's flowing between chips uh, in, in order to get past some of your security measures. This is very popular in the uh, console gaming space, where people like to use uh, uh, get around the copy protection on games and and things like that. Um, and, and we, this is a really crude example here, but you know, there's very sophisticated ones that are very easy to install. Um, and you can, you can solve a lot of that by, by better product security design. Uh, leak tools, I kind of mentioned this, this, this little orange thing here is uh, a little box that uh, you could get around the subsidy lock on your phone back in 2005, I want to say. Um, but basically it comes with this little box and it comes with some software tools that, that connect to it. And then it has a whole series of different cables, one, one for every different phone model. This is back before USB was standardized and every phone had its own connector. Um, but the idea is that you can plug just about any phone into this and it'll remove the subsidy lock. So you can go get a, you know, a $20 phone from somewhere and then unlock it and take it to another network and that'll save you like hundreds of dollars on, on your phone price. Um, when we actually got one of these and we were trying to figure out why, how it worked on our phones, we found inside here was a verbatim copy of our own factory tools embedded in this little box. Uh, so they they just got a copy of our tools and were just using them against us. Um, so you know we had to implement better authentication mechanisms there so that only authorized users were able to to do that. Um, the next step once we did, had done that is you know you couldn't actually configure any of our phones or or make counterfeits unless you were on our network and we thought that was good. And then what it turns out we had a guy in in one of our third party repair centers who was being paid five hundred bucks a week to just keep one of these GSM modems plugged into one of the test stations, uh, effectively bridging our factory network to China where there was a whole factory floor um, doing all of this, uh, this counterfeiting operation. Um, you know, we, we had some detection mechanisms in place, so it didn't, didn't, they didn't uh, get away for very long, but it basically shows the lengths that they're willing to go to. Um, you know, in Hungary, 500 US dollars a week is, is quite a sum. Uh, and so there's definitely money to be made uh, if, if you're willing to skirt the process. Um, and then once you get deeper into the system, so this image is a this one I took off of Google image search, but what they've done here, this is a scanning electron microscope image. And what they've done is they bored a hole in the insulator on top of the chip itself. And, and the white parts are the metal uh, and the dark parts are the insulator. Uh, and the metal kind of glows with the electron microscope. And what they've done is they bored a hole here and you can see the little trace of, of metal under there and they've cut it. Uh, and so maybe this is a, like a security signal, a security related signal. So they cut that and then they've disabled some security. Um, you can also deposit materials and rewire it to bypass um, like fuses that might have disabled some security features and things. At this level, there's there's no real good solutions. Um, this is where like smart cards and TPMs, secure elements, this is the kind of things that they do. They put all sorts of mitigations in here to try and obfuscate the silicon. But basically what you're talking about here is like thousands of dollars an hour to do this attack. And if you if you're, component is secure enough that you're requiring the attacker to go to these lengths, you've done a really, really great job. And you're ahead of 99.9% you know, of the market. So this is kind of where you want to be. Uh, a cheap circuit level attack like these mod chips, like that's that's a $5 attack. Um, that's not what you want. So how do you detect this? Um, I'm not going to go through all of the different measures here. A lot of this stuff is, is things that are kind of obvious. Uh, but the main thing here, if you take nothing else away from this, is this first line. Uh, the number of devices that you order from your factory, the number they built, the number they shipped, and then the number that get activated in the field, those numbers should all be very closely related. Um, if you start seeing huge numbers of devices being activated, but you didn't actually build them, then somebody else is building them. And that's something you should be able to see in your data. Now, the problem with this is that those data systems aren't often connected. Uh, what we find when we're, we're, we're doing these sorts of investigations with our customers is, you know, the factory systems are totally different from your procurement systems, which are totally different from your operational systems dealing with the activations uh, and getting all that data in one place so that you can match those databases together and identify the, the, the normal behavior and the, you know, the outlier behavior, that, that, that's a big challenge. Um, yeah, so like in the example that we had where, where that GSM modem was plugged in, like every test station, for example, was building you know, eight or 10 devices a minute, except this one specific station was doing a thousand a minute. And you can only plug in so many USB cables. So that didn't make any sense. Um, and when, of course, then we went and investigated, we found this modem uh, in the bridge network, et cetera. Um, and this is going back uh, at least a decade. So the, I mean, these, these attacks are definitely out there. It's something you need to be aware of. Um, and of course, then there's all the factory network hardening, making sure like you're not running Windows XP or, or you make sure your systems are all patched. Uh, 
you know, your network security firewalls, all, all that standard IT security stuff is definitely something you need to be pushing on your factories, especially your third party factories, uh, where you don't necessarily have control that might need to be built into your, um, into your contracts. Um, yeah, it's just, there's lots of patterns in the data um, that you can you can spot uh, when you're trying to detect this, and that's really it. Um, so th there's a white paper I wrote about this uh, a number of years ago now, and there's a link here. Um, but basically, that's that's the end of the presentation. If anyone has any questions, um, I'm available to take them now. Okay. Do you want to stop sharing there, Rob, and we'll kind of go back to the full room? There we go. So, does anyone have questions for Rob? Hey, Rob. Could you uh, could you put your um, it, it, the link that you shared into the chat window so we can read your article? Yeah, certainly. And Brenda's going to uh, send the slides around after as well, so it's probably even easier. Yeah. Okay, we'll, thank you. And we'll also send out the recording of this too. Any other questions? You see that, Rob? The question uh, in your I'm, chat button. Yeah, I got it. Uh, okay. Uh, specific standards, there, there's a number. Um, one, one of the big ones that actually come up quite recently is uh, IOXT, uh, Internet of Secure Devices. Um, there's also the IoT Security Foundation. They're mostly out of the UK. Uh, that's kind of up and coming. Both, both of these are trying to set a baseline of security. Like, you know, you have to at least meet this bar to kind of get some sort of certification. There, there are others that go quite a bit farther, like uh, Common Criteria was a big one uh, a number of years ago. Honestly, we don't see that one very often anymore. Um, Common criteria is very heavy handed. You need to do quite a lot of documentation. It can take, it can take, you know, years to get your product pushed through common criteria. As a result, we don't see a lot of procurement uh, people requiring that anymore. And it typically was government procurement, um, but that one did have some, some power to it. Then there's also, there's also FIPS, which tends to deal mostly with cryptography or any kind of like hardware modules that are doing cryptography. Both, both common criteria and FIPS kind of suffer from a problem where, where it's almost like a self-evaluation. You get to define what the security boundaries are, and then you, you test against that boundary. If you've drawn that boundary wrong, you could still pass the certification, but it doesn't really mean anything anymore. And we see a lot of products that kind of fall into that camp. IOXT and IOTSF are more consumer electronics bit, uh, driven. Uh, and they're taking a different tack. They're, they're starting from the bottom up. And so they're basically trying to eliminate the, the lowest of the low. Um, so their baseline security posture for those certifications is actually quite a bit lower than what you should have, but it at least eliminates a lot of the really common vulnerabilities we see. Um, there's other things in the middle ground where um, they're more about the process by which you build devices, like ISO 27001 and things like that. Th those, are, those are more about like how you build things, not necessarily about the results and whether or not it's secure. So, so yeah, there's, there's some, uh, but it's definitely a growth area. It's not probably a good answer, but that is the answer I have. And do you see Brian's question there and Dale? And thank you, Ben, for sharing those links. Yeah, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, circuit modifications in manufactured devices. That's an interesting one. So, so if it's been modified after you built it, it's, I mean, it's obviously really hard because you'd probably be relying on the software that's on, running on the device to try and do that detection. The other way is like when it comes back in for repair, for example, you could detect it. What we find a lot of our, our customers are interested in these days, uh, kind of in the wake of that Bloomberg article, um, is, is they're doing kind of spot checks uh, as data uh, as machines get deployed in their data center they're they're doing things like optical inspections they're doing uh, x-ray images they're doing all sorts of things like that to try and spot anything that's obvious and out of the ordinary um, but but the best I mean it, I guess it really depends on on who, on who you are Brian and, and what you're trying to, to detect here if you're if you're buying equipment and you're just doing this as part of your your deployment um, the answer is quite a bit different than if you're like processing devices at your um, RMA intake, for example, to see if it's been modified in the field. There's another question here. Security for industrial devices. Yes. Yeah. So, so in, like I said, NCC is a UK based company. There's a, a huge smart meter rollout going on in the UK and there's only a few certified labs who are able to test all of these smart meter devices. And we're one of them there. And so we've been doing a lot of devices for things uh, of that nature, but that's, that's more um, like distribution for electricity and gas and things like that. And, and they do have quite stringent security requirements that they have to meet uh, in order to test those devices. Um, we've seen a number of, of uh, 
like uh, energy companies, you know, like uh, oil rigs and, and, and mining equipment, things like that, where uh, they're, they're doing quite quite a lot of security due diligence on all of the equipment that they're they're purchasing uh, or developing. Um, yeah, and there, I mean, I'm not aware of any specific standards, if, if that was the question, but uh, definitely, there's definitely a lot of testing you can do there. And it really follows to the same kind of testing that your your IT security teams are doing and, and making sure that they're managing the risk. Uh, and, you know, at the hardware side, we just kind of go deeper. Oh, Brian was talking about ASICs. Yeah, detecting that is, is quite difficult. If somebody's going to as far as modifying your chips, uh, you have a much harder problem. I have seen some devices, and they're not cheap. Um, and they're primarily being sold to folks who are like uh, in the military space. If you're building fighter jets, for example, every single component that goes onto your circuit board, you're going to want to test. And what they'll do is they'll boot it up uh, and they'll measure like an EM signature. And so when it boots up, it, it radiates this particular pattern. Uh, and then they'll verify that against a, a baseline of what normal looks like and anything out of the ordinary. If there's any extra circuitry in there, um, then, you know, it'll it'll raise a red flag. DARPA uh, 10 or 15 years ago now had a, I think it's probably 10 years ago, they had a, uh, a contest to see who could uh, detect uh, backdoors inserted into the silicon. So what, one of the things about the, the, the chip industry is that there's very few companies out there that have their own foundries. A lot of them will be fabulous and they'll like outsource to like someone like TSMC or Intel or uh, TI has a big fab. Um, and so if you're doing, if you're doing that kind of work, uh, you know, how do you how do you ensure that after you've given your design documents to to your foundry, they haven't inserted a bunch of extra circuitry, which isn't easy to do. It would have to be very targeted, but it could happen. And if you're building fighter jets or something of that nature, you're definitely going to be concerned about these sorts of things. Uh, so anyway, DARPA had this contest and they had a whole bunch of academics trying to develop little back doors and stuff to stick into chips uh, undetected. And then they had another bunch of teams trying to develop mitigations to detect them. Um, haven't seen the results of that actual contest to see how that panned out, but Definitely, there's a lot of research happening in that space. Ah, yes, raising out fighter jets. <laughs> well, I was going to say thank you, Rob. Um, it's obvious that this is um, lots of people very interested in that. Um, okay, why don't we let answer that last question with Dale, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, Risk five is interesting. So, Risk five is is uh, kind of a new uh, chip architecture that's coming out, uh, CPU architecture. And this whole thing is that it's open source. Anyone can design and build these with unencumbered from, from patents and, and whatnot. So like ARM is, is a licensed architecture. Intel is the only one who makes Intel chips. Um, it, anyway, RISC-V is neat. It has some neat security properties. It, I, I'm holding reservation for, for RISC-V. It has a lot of room to catch up still. Um, there's a lot of ground to make. Typically what we find though, it's not the CPU architecture itself that suffers from security problems. It's, it's how it's integrated into the SOC. There's a lot of things that go around outside the, like the CPU core that have to be done right. And that's that's where 90% of the issues that we find are gonna be. Um, so I, I'd have to see who's actually making these RISC-V chips. And right now it seems to be very experimental. Um, so give, give it a few years and, and, and I'll have a better answer. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, like I, we mentioned, we will be sending out um, the deck and the recording this afternoon. So, and with Rob's connection, um, contact information, if you want to continue the conversation with him. Um, so next up, we have Mike McCoy, who's with the Azure Edge device team from um, Microsoft. And he just has one, one short little um, blurb here for you before we finish up the morning. Mike, do you want to take over? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for welcoming me to the, uh, the meeting today. Um, big fan of this group. Um, I've attended a couple calls, and I think you all do a great job. Excited to potentially partner with some of you. Um, let me, okay, I'm not real good with Zoom, obviously. We, we do Teams, but uh, let me <laughs> figure out where I'm doing here. So I'll start in my video. Okay, so you can see me. Yep. Um, so, I'm Mike McCoy. I'm with a team called Azure Edge Devices. We're about a year old and, and we're really focused on the edge device ecosystem as well and, and, and particularly running AI at the edge. And, and so um, uh, it's a growing area in, in IoT and in industrial IoT. And, and so um, we've, been, we've been hard at work uh, talking to um, 
all sorts of companies along the entire value chain to, to learn about what uh, what's needed to solve a lot of the integration problems and 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 really make this something that that uh, businesses can and deploy and 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 see return on investment from. So with that, um, we we ha are building a, a platform for lack of a better term. Uh, we're calling it Project Santa Cruz, and I'm going to try sharing my screen. Okay. And so I have one slide. I promise I won't take too long. Let me know if you can see my screen. Are we We're good? good? You no? are good. Okay. So it, like I said, Santa Cruz is an end-to-end -end edge AI platform we're building. Um, I'm just going to step through some of the key components real quick here. So the first is hardware reference designs and dev kits. So um, we um, actually have a dev kit we've built um, and uh, that contains, um, it's a perception, the focus on perception AI. And so um, it contains um, both, uh, you know, three major components, a carrier board, um, a, uh, a camera SOM and a audio so speech and audio SOM. So system on SOM, system on module, each SOM contains AI acceleration on the SOM as well as uh, security and then this, the sensor. Um, those connect to the, the carrier board, which contains the CPU and, 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 and wireless and, and everything needed there. Um, we're, we're excited about this dev kit and what it can do for companies wanting to build um, um, proof of concepts uh, that that becomes scalable. Um, in addition to that, um, because we're, so, we're, we're driving the ecosystem, we work with a lot of uh, um, device builders and and ODMs and OEMs. And, and so we provide hardware reference designs as well. The, the next level is a um, kind of a set of experiences or services that that uh, that help with the integration. So um, with that, you're able to, um, when building your proof of concepts, we offer a lot of um, uh, uh, solution building um, experiences ranging from no code solutions all the way to more advanced coding um, to, to build your machine learning models as well, and AI. And then we move into lifecycle services where um, bulk provisioning and um, uh, and and security and 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 other other services to help scale and move your solutions to production and then finally we have a, um, a series of programs to work with our partner ecosystem um, the hardware ecosystem and and again kind of circles back to some of the reference design works but also uh, you know helping build that and 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 uh, helping um, partners, you know, build devices that natively work on the Azure platform. Um, throughout all that, um, we uh, see this as an opportunity to do matchmaking um, along different parties along the value chain, and and um, and 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 really make it easier and simpler to to get. Uh, edge AI solutions um, to production. So that is a really quick summary of, of what we do. Um, the, what I'm here to really announce is we're doing a private preview. Um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, we have a limited number of spots, but it's not, but there's still, I mean, there's, there's plenty, we'll just say that, but, but it is, um, uh, it's not unlimited, we'll say. Um, as part of this, private preview, um, every uh, participating company would get uh, one of our dev kits and, um, and, and they would get them to keep um, when it's all said and done. We're not expecting them to be returned and, and then access to the early versions of, of our platform. And so the, the, the AKA MS link I have up there, SC preview, um, it is a simple form to fill out and to let us know if you're interested in, in joining the private preview. Um, uh, I was hoping that we would have devices ready to head out 
this week, but we're experiencing some production delays um, um, due to a bug found and, so, and then holidays over in Asia. So at this time, we're thinking they might not be available till the end of October. Um, so that's plenty of time for you to get this, the form filled out and, and, uh, um, and, you know, if it looks like a good match for our program, then we'll reach out to you. Uh, any questions? So thank you, Mike. Um, as mentioned, we will send out that link and all the information around that this afternoon. Um, we're quite excited to have Microsoft as one of our proud sponsors. Um, so in wrapping up, because I'm very cognitive of the time today. Um, you will have Rogers Communication as our keynote speaker next month on 5G. If you are subscribed to us, you will get notification as we put out other events over the next couple of months. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Mike. Um, enjoy the beautiful weather that we are having. Have a good day. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks. Guys, cheers. Thanks.